Garnet Chan here. Garnet is the Brand Professor of Chemistry in, at Caltech. Um, his, his, he works on, uh, of course, in theoretical chemistry, but uh, at the intersection of that, condensed matter physics and quantum information. Um, so he has worked extensively on the simulation of quantum many body physics and uh, systems and quantum chemistry, uh, both from the classical side and, and from the point of view of quantum simulation. Um, so I, you know, uh, I, I have to say that I'm, I'm particularly looking forward to Garnet's, uh, Garnet's talk. Uh, I, I think um, uh, his, uh, you know, in, in my, uh, 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 you know, in, in, in my experience, he, he's been the one who has been, um, you know, most clear in expressing, uh, you know, the, 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 the big picture as well as the subtleties of, of, uh, of the problems in simulating quantum chemistry. So, so uh, with that, uh, Garnet, uh, looking forward to your talk. Okay, great. Uh, well, thanks for the introduction. Um, and thanks for the invitation to speak here to all of you. Um, and so you see the title of my talk here is the evidence of uh, exponential quantum advantages in quantum chemistry. Um, and you see at the bottom, a very long list of names. The content of this talk is, is mainly contained in a paper, which uh, we very recently submitted. Um, and many people contributed to uh, helping to improve the arguments within the paper. And, and, and so this is why you see uh, so many people uh, there today. So uh, on, on this list here today, so this paper would not be possible without many contributions. Okay, but in any case, I, I will get to business. Um, and so um, we're going to be talking about the quantum simulation of uh, chemistry today. Um, and I think usually the idea that one should be using or one might use quantum devices to simulate uh, physical problems such as chemical problems uh, is usually traced back to you know, a comment from Feynman, uh, which has been repeated many times and, and I, uh, I, I quote it here. You know, Feynman's comment is not especially direct, um, but uh, today one has more direct statements to the effect that quantum computers are, in fact, uh, you know, very well matched to problems of uh, chemistry simulation. Um, and because of this uh, intense interest, you know, it's of course then important to really understand uh, what the advantages are uh, of simulating chemistry uh, on quantum devices. And so that's the subject of today's talk. Okay, so to proceed, um, I, I of course have to define quantum chemistry in a more formal way. Um, and quantum chemistry com is comprised of many different computational tasks, um, but probably the most central one, and certainly one that people uh, often talk about in this, and what is the starting point for many other simulations is computing the ground state of a particular Hamiltonian, uh, the electronic Hamiltonian. It describes the physics of the electrons in the molecules and in the materials. And the Hamiltonian has some particular form. Uh, it contains the kinetic energy of the electrons and the uh, Coulomb interaction between them and the external field of the nuclei. Um, and we're going to be concerned with computing the ground state eigenvalue, uh, the so-called ground state energy. Now, the reason why the energy is so important is because from these energies, you can deduce many things. For example, if you take two different uh, configurations of molecules, you can subtract the energies, you can obtain the reaction energy. Um, if you work with materials and you compute the energies of different phases, you can understand the thermodynamic stability. If you compute the energy as a function of the nuclear coordinates, that gives you this thing called the potential energy surface. And this is essentially what governs reaction dynamics or the rates of reactions. And then finally, of course, if you understand the energy as a function of an external perturbation, uh, that's a starting point for uh, modeling uh, spectroscopy. So computing the ground state energy uh, is an important thing to do. Um, now to make this something that we can analyze the complexity of or, or talk about the complexity of in a slightly simpler way, we'll, I will first discretize um, the problem of computing this, uh, computing this eigenvalue. And so for this, I'll introduce a single particle basis um, and the basis size the size of the single particle basis I'll call L, and that will be the problem size. Note that the, the many particle Hilbert space is then exponential in L. Okay, so L refers to the single particle basis size. 
And we'll be trying to understand the complexity of this task as a function of L. Um, and there are different ways of changing the problem size that one can imagine. So in one case, you might take a fixed physical system, for example, a, the neon atom. And as I increase L, I might just add more and more basis functions for this single atom. That's sort of increasing the resolution at which one is looking at the problem. So that's one way to increase L. But, but today we'll be, going to be thinking, we'll be thinking only about a different way where when I talk about increasing problem size, I'm actually also increasing the physical size. So I'm increasing the number of atoms as well. So when I increase, in, increase L, I mean more and more atoms in the problem for a fixed discretization per atom. Um, and essentially what we then want to understand is the complexity of computing the ground state energy uh, for, these, for these Hamiltonians as a function of L uh, for something that I call uh, generic molecules and materials. Um, and this term generic uh, is um, both a very important term and also one that is a little bit hard to uh, pin down as I'll explain uh, uh, later. Um, I'll say at this point in the talk that, uh, as Omesh explained, you know, I'm a quantum chemist, I'm not a quantum computer scientist, um, but I will try in this talk to talk about things in a way that hopefully is of interest to people in quantum computer science. Okay, so we want there to be, you know, some advantage in this task for uh, quantum, quantum computers. Um, and so how, what is quantum advantage? Um, so to define quantum, oh, so first I should say, I will only be thinking about quantum advantage uh, for perfect quantum computers. So, so we think everything will be considering a case where things are fault tolerant and you can run the quantum algorithm for an infinite amount of time. So, for, so to define quantum advantage, however, you need sort of a ratio of costs because you need to know, you also have to have a classical counterpart. So the quantum ratio is really the cost of the quantum ground state algorithm versus the classical ground state algorithm. And we'll have a quantum advantage if the numerator is smaller than the denominator. Um, now, what you really want is a, an advantage that sort of grows as your problem size gets more complex, as you increase the problem size L. Um, and a very desirable type of quantum advantage is an exponential speed up. So the exponential and exponential quantum advantage or EQA essentially says that the, uh, the quantum speed up is exponential uh, uh, in the problem size L. And the EQA hypothesis is that this type of speed up is available uh, for this uh, ground state quantum chemistry problem. Um, in this work, we'll be examining a specific version of the EQA hypothesis. In particular, we'll assume that the quantum ratio takes the following form, uh, that the numerator is polynomial in the system size and the denominator is exponential in the system size uh, for some given precision, epsilon. Um, here I'll, I'll, break, I'll say that in different problems, uh, different notions of precision are, are, are appropriate. So uh, for certain problems, you care about the absolute precision in the energy, um, but for other problems, uh, typically things in the thermodynamic limit, um, the relative precision is, is really the more useful metric. Um, and that is just the precision divide by L. And I will, just, I will distinguish between these two by, so by introducing a bar. So relative precision will be epsilon bar. So, uh, so this talk is really about the evidence supporting um, uh, what, what the evidence is for this EQA hypothesis uh, in this uh, particular problem. Okay, so now let me get onto this uh, concept of generic. Um, and the reason why we have to introduce this word generic is because uh, without any assumptions whatsoever, EQA, as I've defined it, uh, is impossible for this task. Um, the reason is because we, we are stating we want this quantum ratio to take this form where the cost of ground state determination is polynomial for quantum and exponential for classical. Uh, but we've known for quite a long time, I guess, getting on to 20 years now from uh, the work of Kitaev that, that finding ground states is not, is not something that's always easy on a quantum computer. In, in, in fact, the, it's in the class QMA or loosely speaking, you know, it can be exponentially hard. Um, the intuition behind the existence of these QMA problems, you, you might think of them as essentially glassy-like problems, like spin glass problems. And these problems have this characteristic where, for example, if you were to just increase the system size, you know, on the boundary, you can completely change the you know, nature of the ground state in the bulk. 
Um, and these problems are basically difficult for quantum computers, they're difficult for classical computers. Okay, so if we want to talk about EQA, then in some ways we, we need to sort of exclude these problems. Um, and perhaps these problems aren't really very relevant for typical chemistry or generic chemistry and material science. Like this is perhaps a reasonable uh, point of view to hold. Okay, so, so we're going to just assume that there exists some kind of generic chemistry which excludes these problems. Um, and so in practice, um, generic chemistry uh, is then quantumly easy, is the hypothesis. The problem is once you introduce these types of exclusions or additional assumptions, uh, it's, it's possible that they could introduce some loopholes for classical algorithms to become efficient as well. Um, and, so, uh, and so if you use this addition, additional information, you know, you, can, you might be able to construct classical heuristics uh, where these problems are also not so hard. Um, and so what we really need to uh, understand is the cost of quantum algorithms on this class of so-called generic chemistry problems versus the various classical heuristics that people have proposed uh, to study uh, to obtain uh, ground state energies. So at this point, I'm going to just define, you know, the type of quantum algorithm that I'm going to think that we're going to examine. Um, I'll say a little bit about classical heuristics, uh, and then we'll look at some of the evidence. Okay, so first, uh, quantum algorithms for ground state energies. Um, well, there's, you know, many of them these days, uh, but, you know, the most famous one is, is, is state preparation uh, plus quantum phase estimation. So let me first talk about that. Um, so this works basically in the following steps. Um, so first you have to prepare some approximation to your ground state on the quantum device. So this is a state preparation step. Uh, and then you measure the energy by the phase estimation circuit. Um, um, and this is a projective measurement. So you get an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Um, and of course, then it may not be the ground state. So you have to repeat this until the ground state is observed. Um, so the probability of observing the ground state is related to the state that you prepare. So a critical quantity will be this overlap between uh, the prepared state phi uh, and the desired ground state psi naught. So I will, I'll call this quantity S, this is the symbol we like to use in quantum chemistry. And sometimes I'll refer to it, the square of it, I'll call that the weight. Now the complexity of this algorithm uh, it takes the following form. So you can obtain the ground state energy with some effort as polynomial in the inverse overlap, polynomial in the system size, uh, and polynomial uh, in the inverse precision. Um, at the level of this talk, this is the resolution at which I'm going to be talking about the complexity. I'll just say either if it's is it polynomial, you know, the exponential. Um, and there's an additional advantage to leaving things in this um, less resolved form, because as it turns out, Although there are other quantum algorithms for um, determining the ground state energy, uh, their complexity also takes this form. Um, and so we can roughly say that all fault tolerant quantum algorithms have costs which, uh, which look like this. Um, and for some summary of these other algorithms, you can read some of the recent papers uh, by Lin, which are very pedagogical in this uh, context. Okay, so. Um, so how does state preparation plus phase estimation scale as a function of system size? Well, uh, it's clear that there is a piece, you know, the phase estimation circuit, which is explicitly uh, polynomial uh, in system size. Uh, but there's this also this prefactor, this polynomial inverse overlap, and that can also have a system size dependence. Um, and in fact, uh, if one just considers Hilbert space as a function of system size, it's very large. And, and so, if you were just to prepare a random state, uh, then, it's, then it's clear that the overlap as an exponential, that the overlap of the random state with the desired state typically has an exponentially small overlap, which would create an exponential dependence on system size here. Um, and so the possibility of exponential quantum advantage therefore really hinges on the complexity uh, of state preparation. Um, um, and so really what we want to then examine is whether quantum state preparation is in fact easy, polynomially easy, for the class of generic chemical problems, while on the same problems, uh, classical heuristics are exponentially hard so that we get this uh, EQA ratio. Okay, so since state preparation is the key step, the key thing to examine, we'll, we'll just look at some ways in which people propose to prepare states. Um, one of the simplest is uh, what it can be called ansatz state preparation, 
um, that's what I call it. Uh, and in this case, you use some classical approximation to the ground state, um, and uh, then you prepare the same state uh, on the quantum computer. Um, now, there, there's a, a sort of tricky requirement here because uh, you can, if you prepare this classical approximation, you need to make sure that it has certain qualities. If you prepare the exact state classically, for example, that would that would basically mean that you don't have to use a quantum computer at all. So, so you have to prepare a state that in, is in some ways good and in some ways bad. And in particular, you need to prepare a state which has a pretty good overlap because that is what determines the cost of the subsequent quantum algorithm, but it can't have a very good energy uh, because then you wouldn't need the quantum computer. Um, and, and one way you could imagine doing this, for example, is if you just prepared a superposition of your ground state and some arbitrarily high lying excited state. So that would have, for example, good overlap because it has a large component of the ground state, but because you mix in some very high lying state, it would uh, then have a bad energy. Um, so other combinations of qualities, you know, are problematic, right? So if you have a bad overlap plus a good energy, then that's very bad for the quantum computer because, you know, if you improve your overlap, your energy might become uh, exact. Okay, so the real question is, you know, do classical methods, you know, typically yield states with the right characteristics? And in this context, um, often a very simple state is proposed as the state one should prepare, a single determinant state or mean field or Hartree-Fock state. Um, and it's certainly true that if you take a very small molecule, uh, the Hartree-Fock state often has a very good overlap uh, with, the, with the state that you desire. Um, and the energy is poor in the sense that it is not sufficient for many purposes, uh, uh, many uh, quantitative purposes. Um, but EQA is really an asymptotic statement. And so, so the question that we really need to understand with respect to unset state preparation is to uh, quantum chemistry methods usually produce states with good overlap and bad energies really for larger system sizes. And so that's something we'll try to examine today. Another common uh, uh, state preparation strategy is adiabatic state preparation. Um, adiabatic state preparation relies on the adiabatic theorem as the name suggests. Um, and the idea here is that you evolve uh, from some very simple initial state whose ground state is very easy to prepare uh, to your final state. Um, and you, can, you evolve according to some schedule where you change one into the other. Now, if you do this infinitely slowly, uh, then you will obtain the exact ground state. Um, now, but in practice, of course, you only have a finite amount of time. Um, and the time scale uh, over which you should evolve this to get a reasonable uh, overlap with the desired final state uh, is determined by a quantity with the gap, the adiabatic gap, uh, along this uh, evolution path. Um, now, the fact that this that the time depends on this gap uh, immediately sort of makes this uh, clearly a heuristic type procedure because you you don't know uh, a priori, you know uh, what the gap will be or how to construct a path where this gap is not too small. Um, and so for adiabatic state preparation to be relevant to this EQA question, then in some sense, you, you, you're assuming that it's easy to find a path where the gap uh, is not too small, you know, where the gap is, for example, larger than inverse polynomial and system size. Um, it, it's, it's clear that this is not always going to be true. Um, so uh, for example, uh, if you have uh, a, a material or system which has many competing ground states, you can imagine that some of the um, transitions between these, these ground states will be first order. And then and one knows that as you go through first order transition, then typically the gap vanishes exponentially uh, uh, in system size. Um, so, so one way to diagnose whether in fact it is easy or not to find paths with this type of uh, protected gap uh, is to examine the initial state dependence of adiabatic state preparation. Um, and so if it's, if your state preparation time um, depends very strongly on your initial Hamiltonian, it's very fine-tuned in that sense, uh, then essentially this is a very heuristic approach. You have to give it a lot of information to find uh, the right initial Hamiltonian. Um, and an example where this adiabatic state preparation time is known to have a very strong initial state dependence 
is in the case of applying it to uh, unstructured search, you know, some type of like Grover search problems or search through the list. And if you do this through adiabatic quantum computation, then you in fact know that the gap, the minimum gap in the problem uh, looks like one over the overlap of the ground state of the initial Hamiltonian with the ground state of the final Hamiltonian. In this case, this is a, a characterization of this strong initial state dependence. Um, so, so the basic uh, thing we have to understand here is, as I said, how is it easy or difficult to find good paths? And if it's very difficult, then you know this is a very heuristic method. You have to give it a lot of information, and then it becomes difficult to argue that it's uh, really uh, better than classical heuristics because you might be able to use that information to improve the classical heuristic as well. So the question that we're going to try and understand uh, is how heuristic is age of act state preparation in generic or sort of typical quantum chemistry problems. Okay, so, so that's sort of the numerator, the, the, at the various questions about the numerator of the quantum ratio that we want to understand. And now let's just talk about the denominator very briefly. So the denominator is going to be classical heuristics. Um, and we know that there are many different heuristics that have been proposed, which are associated with different electronic structure problems. Um, there's a long list of names and you can put even more on this list. Um, and very roughly speaking, one can imagine the uh, complex, the, the sort of problem space is divided into different domains and different heuristics are sort of cover different domains. Um, so a critical question to ask, of course, is, is there anywhere in the space of problems that people really care about in chemistry and material science uh, where one of these methods doesn't work and in fact, no method can be found that would not require exponential cost. So that's a very, very difficult question to answer without in some sense studying every problem. Uh, but what we can do is perhaps just look at the problems that people typically talk about and then see if in those problems there is uh, any evidence of exponential hardness for classical methods. And, and that is something that we will uh, look at later. Um, a, a, a second question, which is, is also important and which has not been studied enough, uh, is that when one uses classical heuristics, you know, one, one constructs them to have polynomial runtime, um, but of course you don't know the error at the end, right? That's the nature of the heuristic. Um, but you can ask, you know, for some given problem, if, if there's a tunable parameter so you can, you know, improve the error, then, then if I want to desire precision, then what is the cost? You know, do, does this polynomial in L, for example, become exponential in L? And you know, surprisingly, this is something that when we use classical heuristics in, in, in chemical history simulations, we don't usually ask this question. Um, and so not much is known about it. And so this is something that we will also examine. So to summarize so far, um, the EQA, the existence of EQA, it hinges on quantum state preparation being polynomially easy. Uh, while classical heuristics for the same problems are exponentially hard. Um, and this is something that is quite hard to study purely theoretically with the tools of say, just purely theoretical computer science, uh, because you know, uh, I've restricted myself to some class of problems called generic, which I didn't define very clearly. I'm going to be comparing to heuristics, which are obviously hard to analyze mathematically. Um, and so the way in which you're going to try and understand this is really through numerical simulations to produce evidence for one thing or another. Um, and it's important to state at this point that simulations, you know, they are not the same thing as proof, right? And, and many things are not clearly defined, but, but the way in which I'd interpret the findings from this talk is that it produces some evidence and at the end of it, we can weigh the evidence and decide, you know, where we would like to place our bets. Um, and that's the spirit in which uh, I'm going to be proceeding from here. Okay. So the numerical, numerical simulations will fall into two categories. The first set will be concerned with the numerator. Okay, so we'll try and understand the ease and heuristic nature of quantum state preparation. Um, and in particular, I'm going to answer some questions about ansatz state preparation. So do quantum chemistry methods produce states with good overlap and bad energies? Um, and is adiabatic state preparation heurist, like a very heuristic thing or is it sort of not very heuristic in quantum chemistry problems? Um, and uh, I will answer these questions in some simulations on some particular problem, the iron sulfur clusters of nitrogenase. And then secondly, for the denominator, which is the scaling of classical heuristics, in particular, do we see the exponential uh, increase in complexity with system size? And you know, what is the accuracy dependence of classical heuristics? 
For this, I'll look at some other systems. I'll look at some large molecules and a variety of strongly correlated models. Okay, so, so let me just start with the uh, iron sulfur clusters of nitrogenase. Um, and you know these are very interesting chemical problems. I've worked on them for many years. Um, for the purposes of the talk, however, the chemistry is completely unimportant. So they're just some things which look like this. Um, and they have uh, they come in different sizes. Um, and the number of uh, metals in these iron sulfur clusters ranges from um, two to eight. Okay, so you have small clusters with two metals uh, and uh, the largest clusters have uh, eight metals. Um, so one can construct a variety of different representations of the Hamiltonians to describe these different systems ranging from let's say a 40 qubit model to represent the smallest cluster to about 150 qubits to represent the largest cluster. So as it turns out with today's uh, sort of classical algorithms, uh, one's able to obtain reasonable approximations to ground states uh, across these systems. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to look at these approximate ground states, you know, they're sort of reasonably accurate, um, and then use this to analyze some issues of quantum state preparation that I've described. So the classical algorithm here for this in this part of the talk is, is unimportant, it's just providing some, uh, some benchmark data, and we're going to use it to understand state preparation. Okay, so first let's look at the unsat state preparation technique. Um, and here I'm first going to try and prepare the best possible slated determinant state. So this is some very simple initial state. Uh, but I'm going to prepare it so that it has the best possible overlap with the desired ground state. Th this is not exactly the state preparation strategy that people usually talk about where, you, where people prepare the Hartree-Fox state. So Hartree-Fox state need not be the state with best, need not be the slater determinant state with best overlap. Um, and so what I'm doing here should be preparing a state that's better than the Hartree-Fox state because it uses information from the exact solution in principle you know, in practice, you can't actually do this, but, you know, because you don't have the exact state, but I'm just doing this to kind of present a best case scenario. Okay, so this is a plot of the, um, on the y-axis is the overlap, it's actually the overlap squared, the weight, uh, and on the x-axis is the size of the system as measured by the number of metals. Um, and um, it's a log-log plot, uh, sorry, it's a log-linear plot, um, and there's a linear relationship um, there's many points because there's many different flavors of these clusters. Um, but unsurprisingly, because Hilbert space is getting very big, uh, the overlap is decreasing exponentially uh, with the size of the with the size of the system and, and it decreases quite quickly. So by the time one gets to uh, this type of cluster here, you get to quite small numbers, you know, like 10 to the minus seven. Um, and, uh, and since the uh, cost of, uh, of, of the quantum algorithm has an inverse dependence on this y-axis, uh, you know, this is a large number. Okay. Um, and so this just tells you that if I prepare this kind of state that is commonly discussed, um, it doesn't really have the characteristic of, uh, I mean, you know, the energies are not very good, uh, but it doesn't have the characteristic of having a good overlap. It really has bad overlap and just gets worse and worse. Um, and so, of course, this is problematic for this way of preparing states. Um, one might then say, okay, let's prepare a better class of states. You know, maybe, you know, these classical simulations are not so hard in these systems. Well, let's use some better classical simulation. For example, let's prepare a matrix product state. Um, and that case, of course, you can improve the overlap. Um, and indeed, perhaps you could obtain some overlap such that, you know, if one looks at this ratio carefully, the quantum rate, quantum cost versus class cost, there could be some quantum advantage for some fixed size. But at least for some uh, fixed parameterization, this exponential decrease in the overlap is a pretty, uh, uh, is a pretty generic sort of phenomenon. Um, and so asymptotically, uh, this strategy will still be problematic. So then one can consider instead adiabatic state preparation. Um, and uh, just to, to say a little bit more about, you know, uh, be a bit more precise about what we're con going to consider, uh, well, adiabatic state preparation depends on the initial choice of the Hamiltonian and the way in which you change it into the final Hamiltonian. And we're going to just consider in the numerics a linear interpolation path. Um, now, um, 
we're going to evolve for a certain amount of time um, and we want to obtain some desired fidelity and you have to specify this fidelity of course to to know how how long you want to evolve for um, and so we're going to uh, consider the adiabatic state preparation time so that the final fidelity uh, with the true wave function is 75 percent is three quarters now the way in which you would determine this numerically is you should run a time dependent uh, quantum simulation on, on the, you know, do this classically, one would sort of solve the time dependent uh, uh, Schrodinger equation and, and just run this for different times, and then find the time where you get, uh, where you get this 75% overlap. But as it turns out, a much simpler quantity, which is just the adiabatic estimate coming from the adiabatic theorem, is actually very accurate um, uh, in this problem to obtain this 75% uh, fidelity. So here I show the, the uh, relationship between the explicit, the time dependent simulations of the adiabatic state preparation time to get 75% weight versus the adiabatic estimate. And the important point is that these dots here, this ratio is close to one, right? It's order one. Um, and so since it's much easier to compute this adiabatic estimate, uh, this is what we're going to use as the uh, estimate of time. So we're going to do this for one of those smaller iron sulfur clusters because it's, these things are quite expensive. Um, and we're going to consider the dependence on the initial choice of initial Hamiltonian to understand how heuristic this process is. Um, and we're con con going to consider two families of initial Hamiltonians. We're going to consider different mean field Hamiltonians. Um, in the mean field Hamiltonians, you can think about the, uh, the ground state as filling up different single particle levels. And one can just shift the energies of these levels so that different orbitals are filled in the ground state. So you can change the occupancy. So that's how I generate many mean field Hamiltonians. Um, and I'll also consider another class of Hamiltonians, which are interacting Hamiltonians, uh, but rather, but they restrict the interactions in the qubits to be in a subset of the qubits. So, you know, the, if I had all the interactions, you just have the exact Hamiltonian, but maybe I just consider some small window. Okay. So given those two families, then we can uh, ask, you know, what is, is the state preparation time very dependent on the choice of initial Hamiltonian? Um, and so this is a plot of the uh, various state preparation times across all the different Hamiltonians we considered. Um, and, and you see on the y-axis here is the, uh, is the time and it's, it's a logarithmic axis and there's many, many, you know, goes from ranges from 10 to 0 to 10 to the 8, right? So there's many, many decades of time. Um, and so it seems that there is a strong uh, initial Hamiltonian dependence. Now, on the x-axis is some other quantity, um, and you see that in this plot, there, there's a kind of linear relationship. Um, now, uh, what is this quantity on the x-axis? It's actually the overlap of the ground state of the initial Hamiltonian with the ground state of the desired Hamiltonian. So it's some kind of state overlap. Um, and this relationship here tells you that in fact, the, the gap along the adiabatic path, which determines the state preparation time, actually has some dependence, some strong correlation uh, with this overlap. Um, it's, it's also important to, to note that finding one of the initial Hamiltonians with one of these short preparation times is not very easy. Um, so if I were to just take the Hartree-Fock state, so that is the state with Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian, so that produces the, um, the state with the lowest mean field energy, that in fact has a very long uh, adiabatic state preparation time. It's actually longer than the time you need for phase estimation, at least to reach the, this desired precision. Um, so overall, this, this suggests that, in fact, adiabatic state preparation in this, this problem here, but this problem was not chosen to be particularly special, actually has a very high, very heuristic character. It, it's very not easy to find a good starting point or good path. And, and this strong dependence is obviously problematic if it extends to larger systems, if you don't give yourself more information. Um, I'm not claiming here, it's important to note that, that you can't prepare these kind of physical states adiabatically. I'm only claiming that you need, it's, it's difficult to do so without putting in more structure into the problem. And then of course, when you put in that structure, you might be able to use that structure classically. Okay, so, so that's sort of the numerator examined. Okay, so uh, the basic things 
that we see are the following. So we don't see that quantum chemistry methods produce states with good overlap and bad energies in larger systems. And adiabatic state preparation seems to require a lot of heuristic uh, kind of information. So now let's look at the denominator, which is the scaling of classical heuristics. Um, and for this, as I said, we'll look at some large molecules and correlated models. Okay, so, um, so I'll first look at a set of systems that you know, are of interest in a variety of applications, so org organic molecules and biomolecules. Um, and many of the molecules in this, sort of, this class of chemistry um, are what we call single reference in character. And this is just a way of characterizing the ground states we expect. Uh, in particular, those, those ground states are expected to have a good local overlap uh, with, a mean, with a, the standard mean field state, a hartree fox state. So under this setting, there's a variety of classical heuristics which are, are often quite successful. Um, and one such heuristic is this so-called couple cluster theory, where you construct your ground state by the exponential of some operator acting on the hartree fock mean field state. Um, and this so-called cluster operator generates excitations, uh, what we call particle hole excitations. So, um, so this cluster operator can generate one particle hole, two particle hole, and so on and so forth, n particle excitations. And if I truncate the level of excitation, then explicitly you obtain a, 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 a then explicitly this method is a heuristic that is polynomial cost and system size. Um, but of course, we don't know what the error is. Right? So it's without guaranteed error. So the question then is, if I actually would require desired precision so that I can really talk, uh, you know, compare the complexity to the quantum case, then what is the computational scaling? Now, as it turns out, you know, people have been doing couple cluster calculations for 50 years uh, almost. Um, and, and there's a lot of data out there. And although people don't analyze this question explicitly, in fact, all the data is available to analyze this question in the literature. And so, um, and so uh, what I did was I went to look back at some of my, my own uh, calculations with, in collaboration with some people 20 years ago, Mihai Kale and Jürgen Gauss were the other authors. And I just sort of replotted it to look at this question. Um, and so here I show a calculation on a small molecule. This is the N2 molecule, the nitrogen molecule. Um, and here's a plot of the error versus a computational cost by some metric. And it's a log log plot. Um, and you see a linear relationship. Okay. So what this implies is that in fact, the cost to obtain a given precision is inverse polynomial in the error for this molecule. Okay, so this is a finding for a specific molecule, but then one can try and generalize it. Um, and the specific form of the couple cluster wave function basically says that if I now take this molecule and replicate it, so I don't just have a nitrogen molecule, but I have a gas of nitrogen, many nitrogen molecules, then using the same ansatz, uh, you will obtain now a fixed relative precision across this assembly of many molecules. So this is just a mathematical property of the ansatz known as extensivity. And so then what this says is that, you know, since the algorithm is explicitly polynomial cost, um, and as the system size increases, you, you reach a polynomial inverse error in the relative precision, then this is sort of, you know, the cost for couple cluster for many N2 molecules. And then because everything is polynomial cost, you can just convert that also into absolute precision with uh, just polynomial overhead. And so this would be the scaling, the computational scaling for a gas of N2 molecules for absolute precision. And one might then conjecture that this is in fact the scaling in general for couple cluster for this so-called single reference family of problems. Okay, so, so we want to then it's sort of uh, uh, it look at this empirically over a wider set of systems and see if this holds. And for that one, it has to introduce another heuristic so that one can actually do other, other large calculations. And I won't go into those in detail, but I'll just show some results. So, so this is couple cluster with an additional local heuristic. And, and we can look, for example, how the cost scales and see uh, what the error is. So here I consider this the set of organic molecules and so these are just molecules with lots and lots of carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms, and I make a very long chain of them. And, and here on the x-axis, the chain length is increasing. Y-axis is the computational cost, and it's explicitly polynomial cost. And so you see here, you know, this is, at, in fact, it's very close to linear cost because of the local heuristic. 
But the important point is this inset, which shows the error of the method. Now, in these large molecules, we, we don't know what the exact answer is, but we do have experimental measurements of certain quantities. And this is the experimental measurement of the heat of formation. And essentially, this is, this is the error relative to the theoretical result. And, you saw, and this shows that this error is essentially constant as the system size increases. And it's below the number one. One is the typical desired precision in this quantity. So, so one is essentially seeing here that the calculation is polynomial cost and system size for fixed uh, relative precision. Um, and uh, you know the same algorithms can be used in more exotic things, right? So this is a very simple chain, but you can also do this in biomolecules and so on. And these calculations are affordable and have similar error scaling characteristics. Okay, so, so that's one class of um, large systems. And now let me move to another class that people often discuss, which are so-called strongly correlated materials. So strongly correlated materials are challenging for classical ab initio methods, but it's important to note that such calculations are becoming increasingly accessible. So, um, so more and more correlated materials are being simulated with some success. Um, but to, to discuss sort of the scaling of costs and scaling of precision, it's very difficult to, to just talk about ab initio things because everything is very complicated. So, so we'll use as a proxy first low NG models of correlated materials. And this is this simplification from the ab initio calculation to this simpler model is very similar to what I did on these uh, iron sulfur classes earlier, where I just considered a certain number of the orbitals. So two of the models that we'll consider are the Heisenberg model, which is a spin model of typically used to describe magnetism, um, and the Hubbard model, which is a fermionic model, which is usually taken as a model of many correlated electromaterials, such as the high temperature superconductors. And, uh, and I'm going to consider these models at various points in the phase diagram for various system sizes, where the exact, almost exact data or exact data is available because I want to understand the precision. Um, and so for this, I, I have to choose a classical heuristic, and there's many heuristics that one could use, um, but the heuristic that I'm going to show in the next few slides is a tensor network heuristic. And I won't get into any of the details, uh, but tensor networks, you can think in this context, are just a variational ansatz for quantum states which obey some, uh, which have some locality associated with them, some area law like properties. Um, and the number of variational parameters in, the, in, in this ansatz is polynomial in some parameter called D, which is called the bond dimension. Um, and, uh, and these ansatz is by construction. Uh, 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 display some type of area law for the entanglement entropy. Um, now, this is a heuristic, um, and uh, the heuristic enters in various ways. Uh, one way in which it enters is, is that to do calculations with tensor networks, you have to contract these mathematical tensors together to get, to get some numbers out. Um, and in the general case of tensor networks, this contraction, um, you know, exactly is exponentially hard. Um, but one can construct a variety of uh, approximate algorithms for the contraction. Um, and in this case, we'll use a tensor network known as PEPS together with an approximate contraction algorithm, which is explicitly polynomial cost in the system size and polynomial cost in, this vari in the number of variational parameters, although, of course, we don't know the error. So we're going to use a scheme, a heuristic that is polynomial cost by construction. OK. So let's now look at this for the three-dimensional three Heisenberg model. Um, and we're here we're using a three-dimensional tensor network. Um, and the left-hand plot, I'm just verifying that the cost is indeed polynomial in system size. I mean, this should be true because it's sort of the way it's constructed. But that's, we see, in fact, that indeed, as a system, this is a log-log plot. And you have a linear relationship. So it's a polynomial. And it's very flat. In fact, this, so this, this uh, implies that it's sort of close to linear. Uh, in the cost gain is close to linear in system size. But more importantly is the error because we don't know the error a priori. And on the right hand side, I show the error, a relative error as a function of system size up to a thousand sites. And you show that the relative error is very constant. Okay. Um, so from this, we observe that the cost is polynomial in system size and close to linear system size uh, for some, uh, at least over this range of problems, uh, for some constant uh, relative precision. Okay, so then how does the precision scale? Um, and so for this, I go to some other data. And so I, here I look at a fermionic model, a 2D Hubbard model, uh, where we have some very accurate data from a variety of other methods. Um, 
And these plots show that show the uh, precision as a function of the number of variational parameters with this, this parameter D here. And this is, a, this is in fact a log-log plot that you see a linear relationship. Um, and this is telling you that the relative precision is scaling as an inverse polynomial of the number of parameters. And since the cost of the calculation is polynomial in the number of parameters, this means that the cost overall is, in, is polynomial in the inverse precision, relative precision. Okay, so the observed empirical scaling of this tensor network in these models is then something that looks polynomial in system size and polynomial uh, in the inverse relative precision. Okay, so, so those are of course models and one might then ask, well, you know, but really, you know, most of the time chemistry concerns more realistic simulations. Um, but it's important to note that models are of course derived from, from the real world. Um, so if one takes a one dimensional Hubbard model, it's a very simple model of electrons with some on-site Coulomb term and some nearest neighbor hopping. But if you just add some longer range hoppings and some longer range Coulomb, you have a representation essentially of hydrogen atoms. Um, and if you add more terms, you can represent uh, other types of systems as well. Uh, so for example, if you have the Hubbard model in two dimensions and you introduce a few more orbitals, and introduce you know, a few other degrees of freedom, then you have the model of the cuprate superconductors. Um, and historically, methods that work with models essentially graduate after a number of years, uh, sometimes it can be many years, uh, from the models to ab initio calculations. For example, this happened with DMRG over at some time in the 90s and with various quantum Monte Carlo methods, for example, dynamical mean field theory, and, and tensor networks of the kind that I was showing you are also undergoing this transition uh, in uh, modern times. And, and the experience is that, at least in the cases that I've described, uh, moving from models to ab initio calculations does increase the complexity, uh, but so far I'm not aware that there is any empirical evidence that the complexity suddenly changes uh, from these sort of polynomial-like scaling characteristics to an exponential scaling. And just an, ex and an example of one such ab initio correlated uh, calculation with now a different heuristic, uh, quantum embedding. Um, I won't go into how embedding works in any detail. It's just some heuristic which assembles observables in some large problem from many small couple calculations that couple together uh, in smaller problems. Uh, one can do some ab initio analog of the, of the uh, Heisenberg models and Hubbard models I showed just now. So these are three-dimensional ab initio calculations on hydrogen cubes and hydrogen sheets. Um, and again, one can assemble a plot which indicates that the cost scaling is polynomial in system size uh, and the relative precision is constant as the calculation uh, size, as the problem size increases. Okay, so that brings me to pretty much the end of all the data. Uh, in the second half, basically, at least for the problems that people commonly discuss, um, you know, it's not clear if there are other problems, but for those problems, we have yet to see an exponential dependence on system size in many of the classical heuristics that people use. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Garnet, there's, there's a question in the chat, maybe if, I wonder if you can address it. It's Antonio uh, Capo who says, um, Yes. Uh, about about this, um, you know, bounding the energy. Where yes. You, where you know the bounds from below, you can bound the error. But what about uh, when you do? Do I? So this is a question about assessing error. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, if the error, if the okay, so I'm almost done. Maybe I've just got one more, one one more slide. But oh, yeah, so sure. let me just finish the talk and I will address the question. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so just to summarize, uh, we examined the evidence for the EQA hypothesis. Um, and, you know, again, I, I'll reiterate that this requires quantum state preparation to be exponentially easier than classical heuristics on the same set of problems. And for this polynomial to exponential ratio, we want classical heuristics to be exponentially hard. So what the simulations do is they raise questions about whether the state preparation is you know, truly exponentially easier. Um, and we don't observe in the class of problems that we saw exponential hardness of the classical heuristics. Um, and so I'll finish by also emphasizing that this is by no means a proof. And certainly we cannot rule out EQA in other cases. Um, 
But you can weigh the evidence and at least as far as, and this is now my opinion, as far as I see, I think it's at least a prudent, uh, a prudent uh, point of view to assume that exponential quantum advantage is not generically available uh, in this task. So that's the main conclusion from this talk. Um, and there are often many questions uh, and here are some frequently asked questions. Um, and one of the most commonly asked questions is, does this imply that there is no use of quantum computers? You know, assuming that the point of view I'm proposing is the correct one, does it mean quantum computers are not useful for chemistry? And the answer to that is no, because exp asymptotic exponential advantage is not in fact required for quantum algorithms to be useful. In fact, in the classical world, any improvement in algorithms is almost always a polynomial improvement and that's still considered an advance. So that's, I would say, an important uh, point to remember. Okay, thank you. So that's the end. Um, and uh, I can then answer questions. I can start with Antonio's question. Great. Well, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Garner. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, yeah, so... Um... Uh, I, I guess Torin, could you uh, could you moderate the the chat, please? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. So, uh, do you do you want me to ask the first question? In oh, the chat? Uh, yes. Okay. So <laughs> I can just ask a question. So, um, okay. So and uh, so Antonio. Um, so hello, Antonio is uh, asking the question. Um, it should be fair to say out loud if the methods considered are bounded from below by the true ground state energy, and, and how do you assess the error for methods that are now not bound from below, or do you, do you compare with experiments? Okay, so um, okay, so I think this is getting at uh, an important point, which is that everything I've this in many ways. One one is that um, I've been comparing to uh, sort of rigorous quantum algorithms where you have some sort of some rigorous things to say about the error. Um, and in the classical heuristic, you do not always have rigorous things to say about the error. So uh, one of the things you can say is if you use a variational algorithm, the error is above that of the, uh, the er energy is above that of the true energy. Um, and out of the data that I showed, um, modulo some uh, subtlety, which I'm happy to address, the tensor network algorithm might be considered a variation, the tensor network heuristic might be considered a variational algorithm. The coupled cluster uh, energies are not strictly variational, though in all these types of single reference problems, they typically are variational. The question is then, if it's not variational, how do you assess the error? It, and, and that's really just, I would say, generally to how do you assess the error of heuristics? And so the way you do so is, of course, in smaller problems, you, you, you benchmark against exact calculations. Um, and in larger problems, uh, you have no guarantee, right? And that's, as, but you have to, as, so usually you kind of infer the behavior from larger systems from smaller systems where you can do careful benchmarking. Okay, second question, Tuhin S, hello Tuhin. Are the problems that are typically solved classically biased towards poly L and will not lend themselves to EQA? Mm -hmm. uh, that is, if I understand correctly, uh, an an insightful question, which is that um, it may well be that problems, typical problems of chemistry, you know, for example, they exhibit some type of locality and things that exhibit some type of locality mean that in some ways you don't have a dependence on the total problem. You don't have a dependence on the total Hilbert size, Hilbert space size, and so they're not very conducive to EQA. So that is, I think indeed a relevant observation. Uh, let me see. Abhinav Deshpande says, uh, you seem to say EQA requires good quantum state preparation, but one can also make states close to say the first excited state with very little overlap with the ground state and stu still do well in quantum phase estimation. The first excited state is close enough in energy, right? Uh, so hi Abhinav, yes, that's correct. You can, you don't, you can, if you're just looking at the quality of the ground state eigenvalue, you can, prepare states, you can ha just have some overlap with the low-lying states, um, but uh, that doesn't itself remove the concerns that uh, are in this talk, yeah. Okay, 
So, I think there's some other questions in the chat as well. I can read them out. Ah, okay. Uh, cool. Yeah. So uh, one is, can you comment? So this is Bastian Brahms. Can you comment, please, on the empirical, practical scaling of FCI QMC methods of Alavi, Booth, and Tom? The empirical, practical scaling. Okay. So, uh, so FCI QMC um, is a method which has two flavors. Uh, the first flavor is called FCI QMC by itself, right? Um, and that has an exponential scaling with system size, um, uh, but essentially all the time, um, unless you magically find a sign-free problem for it. Okay. But the, uh, uh, there's another variant known as the initiator version. Um, and the initiator version, the, the scaling may be more mild uh, but uh, uh, I don't think it's been very well characterized. And my suspicion is that it's still exponential. Great. Uh, I believe Steve, Steve Flania has a, has a question. Steve, do you want to just un Hello, unmute Steve. yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, Garnet. Thanks for the nice talk. I appreciate the um, uh, skeptical take on quantum advantage. Um, I do think there may be a potential weakness in your argument with respect to um, the ground state overlap uh, part of your argument. Mm -hmm. So what you're arguing about is uh, basically the, um, so we use overlap as a way to prove that our algorithms work, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily true. I mean, that, that's a sufficient condition for us to show that our algorithms work in most cases. So, um, I mean, just a really simple example is if I gave you just a paramagnet um, and I uh, prepare the ground state all spins up, uh, but then I tweak each spin by epsilon, then the overlap with the true ground state is exponentially small in the system size, but mm -hmm. all the coarse properties that I'm interested in estimating from the system, I'll be able to recover. So often we prove things that we can you know, we, we prove that our algorithm works by studying things like overlaps, but often those aren't really the questions that we're probing in true um, algorithms. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you're sort of comparing a bit uh, against a straw man by showing that, yes, indeed, the overlap is going to be very small. Um, I mean, I, I would just be curious about what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I think you're pointing out, um, I mean, I don't disagree with you, in, but I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's exactly the reason why classical algorithms work is precisely because of the intuition that you have stated, right? So, so in other words, because what you're saying is typically true, that you, that you can act, that these, there is this type of locality. So even you have good, so long as you have these good local overlaps, the fact that what they multiply out to zero is not very important. I mean, that's essentially what classical heuristics use. But the point is that, you know, that type of property can be used classically as well, so that the, the exponential quantum advantage is, is, uh, is unlikely. Right. right. Uh, I, yeah, I agree. I'm just wondering if um, there aren't other scenarios where you get a quantum advantage, even though maybe it's hard to get uh, an adequate classical advantage from using this fact. Yeah, I don't so know. It seems, it seems like an open question to me. That's an open question. So in other words, you can start to make heuristic quantum algorithms, with, for example, which start to yeah. take advantage of this property. And it's quite possible that you will have uh, quantum advantage in those cases. Um, the question, though, is, is we don't know what those are. I mean, we, those algorithms haven't yet been formulated, right? Those are not the ones yeah. I'm comparing against. But also, there's also a question of whether you expect exponential advantage in those cases versus some right. quantum advantage. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Great, I think uh, Ike Chong also has a question. Yeah. Thanks, Umesh. Garnet, I really enjoyed your talk and I find your argument quite convincing. And so maybe much like Steve, I'm interested in trying to change the question. Yes. And I'm curious about your opinion. I, I suspect that there will be a different flavor of questions for which there can be quantum advantage. And my flavor of choice is decision questions. That is, what is the color of the paint? What is the yeah. smell of the chemical? And I'm curious for your opinion, do you believe that that might lead to a better uh, possibility or probability for, for quantum advantage? Um, I, so in a strict sense, I mean, 
yes, right, you can formulate, um, say, um, some BQP decision problem as a ground state of some Hamiltonian. And so clearly finding, the, finding that, you know, find this ground state uh, uh, shouldn't be classically easy, right? So, right? so we can formulate these things so that it's true. The question is, of course, whether those problems are the ones, you know, correspond to the questions that we ask. And I, I don't know. I mean, my, you know, my, my personal opinion is that many problems may not really fall into that type, but, you know, I, yes, I don't have a, yeah, I don't really know the answer yet. So, I mean, like theoretically, yes, but in practice, I don't know. Yeah. It, it seems to me that maybe quantum chemists have gotten addicted to asking for ground state energies. And so yeah. I'm hoping to convince some more chemists to think of decision questions that would be worthy and, and, and interesting that are hard for them currently, but might be easy for quantum computers, particularly because algorithms, quantum algorithms often seem to uh, like to give qubit type responses, such as the singular value transform algorithm. And this is the origin for my, my hope here. I see. Right. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, part of this reflects just my ignorance in what decision problem, like what kind of problem. You know, I think of BQP in my 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 encounter with that is like quantum dynamics, and I'm sort of less familiar with what kind of interesting decision problems you know like are are there in BQP. Thank you. Um, you sorry. actually sound more like a computer scientist than a chemist in your answer, <laughs> so I appreciate that. I'm uh, pretending to be one just for this talk. Yeah. Uh, Sergio has a comment or question. Uh, do you do you want to ask directly, Sergio? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, yes, loud and clear. Uh, hi, Garnet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think that you, you make you know to make the case that transfer networks and BEPs in particular can solve generic chemistry and physics in polynomial time. Which you know is, is an hypothesis that has been around, but I think you're making a disclaim beyond an hypothesis is you know uh, conjecture, I guess now. Um, you're extrapolating from uh, my, my concern is about the relative error scaling with the uh, bond dimension, and I think the data is also consistent. I mean, I don't know what's the scaling, but what I, what I see is that the data is inconclusive. It's also consistent with an exponential scaling of uh, relative error with bond dimension. And furthermore, you're extrapolating from bond dimension eight to infinity and from quasi 1D to 3D and from you know translational invariant to cases which are not translational invariant and can be closer to spin glasses. So you're doing you know like a big extrapolation with inconclusive data in my view. So I guess um you know I don't know what the, the, the truth is. I don't know if the hypothesis that you know tensor networks are polynomial is true or not, but I'm a bit skeptical about all these extrapolations. So I guess my question is if you want to comment on this, or at least I will just, you know, put it out that, I mean, there are all these extrapolations in the way. Yeah, I mean, okay. So I think this relates to, um, this relates, so, I, I mean, there are various statements that you made which are not technically correct, right? So for example, there is no translational invariance in these calculations and so on and so forth. And the plot against, or against, uh, exponential does not really look like a line and so on and so forth. But the, but I completely agree nonetheless with a bigger point that you're trying to make, which is that um, the uh, data is limited um, and it's limited both in the systems that are studied and it is limited in the, uh, you know, the size and scale and, and so on and so forth. And so this doesn't really constitute a proof. But the point is simply that it could have been, one could have obtained a very different outcome. So for example, one could have in fact seen very clear evidence of exponential scaling um, with system size uh, for fixed precision. Um, so for some, much of your question is about for the, the precise precision dependence, but for fixed precision, it's really clear that you don't see this exponential dependence. And it's not just for tensor networks. I showed this also for another class of algorithms. And I, I agree. Something else. Fixed precision, yeah. I think for fixed precision, these algorithms are going to be polynomial. I, I, I think that's true. Yeah. So, um, so the point is that one could, one could have seen different evidence, and so 
So you, one can say that this evidence is insufficient because you know, that's a, that's a re it's reasonable to be skeptical in the other direction. But I think to be a strong proponent of EQ in this problems, one has to actually come up with some positive evidence that, uh, that to support the case. I guess what I'm saying, when you look at relative energy as a function of one dimension, it's also consistent with exponential. It's not like you see it's polynomial. You know, it, it could be exponential if you plot it in a different way. It's also yeah. a, a straight line in a similar plot. That's what well, I mean. I mean, you know, this is just not the case, right? But if you, we, but what is certainly true is if you look at these things here, this is a very small range. Um, and one can argue about whether this is truly linear. Um, and that much, I think that is this is this is true. So the statement that this looks like poly one over D or poly one over epsilon has to be taken with a grain of salt, given that this range is small, and that is a fair fair point uh, to make. If you plot it in a similar scale, it looks also as a straight line. I mean, Sergio, you have sent me the plot, and I've I mean, I, I I've looked at it, and you know, this one looks like they ha it, it does, it, <laughs> I don't know what to say. I mean, it's very difficult without showing it, uh, but the data is, it, you know, the data we available when people can plot them and they can make, make a decision, I suppose. Thank you. Uh, Aram, you had a question? Hey, Garnet, this is a very thought provoking talk. And uh, yeah, I think we all need to, to think a lot more about all the things you raised. Um, but one way that we might be able to, you know, avoid, Hypotheticals we can talk about things that we have today are, are cold atom simulators, right? Which are imperfectly controllable. And yes. they can simulate, okay, admittedly, they're simulating things where the Hamiltonian, the target Hamiltonian is pretty close to the system Hamiltonian. Nevertheless, yeah. they're controllable. They can tell us about the phase diagram of things like the unitary Fermi gas, uh, you know, charge and spin transport, um, all in regimes that we, we uh, I mean, I don't argue with your plot, but we don't know how to we don't know how to find those things classically, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so the question is, um, how does this fit your picture? Do you think that you know digital quantum computers won't be able to achieve the same thing, or maybe we can improve the classical algorithms? You just haven't tried hard enough. Uh, yeah. You? Well, that's so very interesting. So I want to I want to emphasize that the fact that there is an exponential quantum advantage doesn't mean that things can be practical classically, right? So. Uh, there could be an enormous polynomial barrier separating us from any from any real results, and and in my view, that's in practice the case. For the, you know, if you ask, well, if I'm saying you, you know classical algorithms are good, why can't I just solve everything classically? Well, in many cases, there's an enormous polynomial barrier, even if it, even if it's not exponential. But but so that's one point. The other thing is that cold atom simulators, in fact, already illustrate some of the um, challenges that. Quantum algorithms have with ground state problems. I think you may, for example, be aware with some experiments with, for example, Rydberg atom arrays like Lucan and so on and so forth, where um, you know some of the experiments are essentially preparing metastable states because the adiabatic state preparation protocol is just not going slowly enough, um, and the numerics you know shows that in fact the state they prepare is not the ground state of the Hamiltonian, and so you know they. Start, you start to be able to re, you know, experimentally examine problems of state preparation, uh, which, is, which is quite interesting. But, but I mean, I think that you know, if I had a quantum computer tomorrow or a cold atom simulator on my desk, you know, I would be using it for lots and lots of things. I'm sure it has many useful applications and many things that would not be possible classically. Uh, I have no doubt. It's just whether these separations we should really be thinking about as exponential separations or polynomial separations, which is really, I think, the question that I want to raise. Great. Um, if they okay, have hundreds so of atoms and we can't do it on a classical computer, like, yeah, I mean, I guess it's true. It could be, who could say, if it's an end to the 10th separation, it could be that too, but. Yeah, um, right, right. Yeah. Great. Um, so um, it seems there's a, there, there are a lot of, uh, you know, it's, a, it's very, thought provoking uh, talk. So what, what we could do now is move on to the panel and then come back to any, any more questions from the audience, uh, you know, towards the end of the panel. So if you could have the, the, the videos pinned for the panelists. Um, okay, so, uh, so I should say we have a, we have a, a really uh, 
you know, a great panel uh, that comes at these questions from, from 